Well, great. Thank you so much, David. Um, so I'm just, at least somebody could be give a thumbs up that you can hear me. And is the screen looking good? Yes, we, we hear you. In Sweet. Okay, well, we can get, we can get going then. Thank you to this, uh, to the South Coast chapter for having me this evening. I actually think that um, this was the, when I, when I returned to work at CMPS in 2000 and early in 2018, I think this was the first chapter where I gave a talk. Yeah, and so uh, I guess, it, you know, I guess this is just uh, something that um, I'm probably going to do for many years to come and hope to do for years to come. I love, I love, uh, you know, chatting with you all and sharing what's going on. Um, things have changed a little bit since my last time presenting to this chapter. Uh, I was the, our Southern California conservation analyst for a couple of years before moving up to Sacramento for a more statewide position. And now I'm, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to, you know, kind of gauge where things have, have gone in one's life by actually returning to do the same thing in a different way. So, um, you know, thanks for just, um, for, you know, for hearing me this, this evening. And, and I, I, I feel like in this presentation, I've squeezed a lot. There are many talks within this single talk. So, if I if you feel like I've glanced over something, it's probably because I have a little bit. But I really wanted to squeeze in as good of an update as I could with the, uh, about what's going on in the conservation program at the state level. So this is our team. Um, we have uh, uh, working for me un under my direction, or like you know, basically under their own direction, and with a little bit of guidance from me. We have Isabella Langone, who's our conservation analyst based in Sacramento. Um, brand new to the, to the team, Alvaro Casanova. He's our conservation advocate, and this is a split position, 60% East Bay chapter and 40% state office. Uh, based, he's based in Oakland. Um, I said our Natalie Hopkins intern, we said goodbye to, um, to our last Hopkins intern, Chris Escobedo, who is actually uh, did most, I think the whole time that, uh, he, that he worked for us, almost a full year, uh, was from, from actually from Long Beach or in the Long Beach area. Um, and then our IPA program, which is, a, which is under the conservation program, Sam Young and Kendall King, Kendall King, who was our actually our first Hopkins intern and just returned to CNPS a few months ago to, as, as a, a full-time IPA program assistant. So that's the team. Um, the talk I decided to to break into three um, three areas. There are these kind of interdigitate a bit at sometimes because certain times projects become things that we do litigation on, and you know sometimes a project can or you know so can identify something that we might want to pursue with with legislation. But we'll do our best. I'll do my best to to make sure that it, it makes some somewhat some degree of sense. So I'm going to start out talking about what uh, the legislative activities, the highest level uh, that that the state program works on. And I thought I'd just share, start out with sharing good news. I think most of the talk is good news. Um, there's a little bit of not so great news. That's the way it is in the conservation world. No surprise um, is a bill that CNPS sponsored. Now CNPS has sponsored a number of bills over the years in the, in the, in the state legislature. Um, this bill called AB 223, um, you probably have heard news about it, um, is, uh, is, was authored by Assemblymember Chris Ward from San Diego. And the photos, you know, the photo of the plants in boxes is really the reason why, um, why we decided to work on this. So this is uh, a bunch of, I believe, Dudleya farinosa, so from, uh, from the Central Coast that were confiscated by state wildlife officials, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And about in 2018 or so, we started hearing reports of, um, of an increase in large scale poaching activities in primarily in Northern California. Um, that has shifted also to some of the rarer species in Southern California. There's been some quite disturbing reports of poaching on the islands of, of plants like uh, candle holder Dudleya, Dudleya candelabrum. Um, the state wildlife folks, the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife um, wardens, estimate that hundreds of thousands of plants have been taken from California in the past few years. And this is largely for the international market. So there's a, there's a demand internationally driving the, the poaching of our, of our native succulents. 
and especially our deadlier, which is really quite sad, actually. Um, so what does the what what the bill what does this bill do? AB two twenty three. So it clarifies that poaching deadly is illegal. To some extent, that's a no no brainer because actually, if you can't really harvest any plants from state or private land without permission of the landowner or a permit from the state, but this clarifies it. Um, it's helpful, I think, in the for law enforcement folks and the, and the district attorneys. It incre also increases criminal penalties so that if if um, if unfortunately we have to the law enforcement folks catch more people doing this in the future, which probably will will actually happen, they have better better penalties, which can help with the law enforcement activities, the prioritization of the of the investigations, and then also gives the district attorneys the tools they need. Uh, we introduced we introduced it first in 2020. Um, everybody knows what happened in 2020. The, the, our, all of our lives got turned on on on, on our on its head, or on our heads, and um, it got um, got axed in the in the fallout of the legislative session in 2020. We reintroduced it this January uh, and garnered a lot of support by many organizations, um, dozens and dozens of organizations. Um, it passed the Assembly and the Senate towards the end of the summer. And just, I guess it was that last week or the week before last, I can't keep track of things. It was last week, wasn't it? That it was signed by the governor. So we have a, we have a, we have a law that was CMPS sponsored, which is really good. Um, this is not the end of the story here. This is, uh, in reality, this is a, a, maybe more of a beginning because we still have a lot of work to do on the, on, to make sure that our, our state, our deadly is our safe and, and conserved in situ. Um, in the coming years, we will be figuring out, I think, you know, unfortunately, one of the things we're going to have to do is figure out how to how to stem the demand, because this is really getting at the supply side of things. And um, there is essentially much more that we can do to, to stop poaching of deadly and other plants in California. Um, there is a disturbing trend in the harvest of white sage, which is, you know, Salvia apiana, Southern California native and, and Baja native plant um, and by for the, you know, for the domestic and international market. We could talk about plant poaching probably all day, unfortunately. I'm going to leave it at that, and I'll answer questions on this if there are any um, going forward. Um, this, um, you know, at the legislative level, we also we do quite a bit of advocacy. We have a lobbyist. Many some folks on on um, in the chapters may not know that we have a contract lobbyist. We've had a we've had um, somebody in that position, I think, for at least two decades now. Um, our kind of brand new lobbyist is Kim Delfino, who was uh, prior to going out on her own and starting a consulting firm, uh, was the California program um, director for Defenders of Wildlife. So she held a very, very important position. She's a wonderful ad, um, advocate and asset as a, you know, for CMPS. Um, each year we track dozens of bills, um, you know, and, and this is mostly in the state. We also track some federal bills as well. And we develop positions on bills. And we, those are, you know, uh, pretty simply supporting, uh, staying neutral or opposing them, and we write letters to to make sure that that our um, our our voice is heard at the state level, and and one of the things that's kind of cool about this is that um, people who are like the authors of bills and the sponsors of bills really don't like opposition. So if there's a reason for us to oppose a bill, there's often a, a very um, um, a very good chance that we will be able to work with the author to hopefully um, cure a little bit of that opposition. Not always, that's not always the case, but it does happen. Um, the photo there, in case you're wondering, was when I, I gave some testimony in front of the assembly, um, uh, the, a, an assembly subcommittee last fall on, on wildfire. Uh, continuing on with legislative advocacy, we track the state budget to make sure we're advocating for the, the right things as far as, uh, uh, the, as far as our state's native plants and habitats are concerned. Um, we had, um, we also worked on a trailer bill. So at the end of the legislative session, there's the opportunity to introduce um, new laws or um, guardrails essentially on state budget items. Um, we had a, a um, had worked with the with the Senate on some language to clarify the definition of type conversion. Type conversion being that when when one habitat changes to another, specifically with with regard to land management act activities related to wildfire in this case. Uh, so if you you know clear chaparral or burn it too often, it can convert to non-native grassland, which is a really bad thing for our habitat. Um, 
so we had a bill in the legislature to um, to um, clarify type conversion and put some guardrails on actions that our state um, our state was would will be taking in the coming years, and that got axed unfortunately at the last minute. Um, this type conversion statute was partly result of our what we're calling our unicorn letter, which was um, you'll see all the logos here on the right. This is the front page of a letter that we that CMPS wrote in the spring, which was dealing with the same issue of type conversion and some other issues related to wildfire. Um, why we call it our unicorn letter is because um, some of the folks who um, were, were allied with told us that it was very unlikely that we would get folks like the Center for Biological Diversity and the Sierra Club on the same letter as folks like Sierra Forest Legacy and some of the more um, forest management uh, focus groups. And we got it, we, we through a lot of negotiations, we were able, able to get this letter out the door and it did have influence Although the result that we wanted, that kind of some of that language on type conversion didn't make it into the this year's, um, uh, didn't get signed by the governor, uh, we'll build on this next year, I hope, with perhaps even a, a, a bill in the regular legislative session. So um, if you follow CNPS on, on social media or have been watching things that, at the state level, you also might, have, might recognize that there is some new legislation that CNPS is championing. Uh, this time a, a federal bill. Um, this is related to Walker Ridge, which is this um, polygon on the right-hand side of your screen in red. Um, for If you're not familiar with, with Walker Ridge, which a lot of you I'm sure are not, um, this is just about an hour and a half or so north and east of San Francisco. Uh, on the, the line between, this is a, here, this, this uh, black line is the line between Calusa and Lake Counties. This is just a little bit to the east of Clear Lake um, and adjacent to Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument um, and famous wildfire viewing areas uh, in, um, in Bear Valley. Uh, this is a piece of land managed by the BLM, which is really special. It's a, there is, it's, is, um, the geology is, is um, influenced by serpentinite, or ser and so we have a lot of serpentine habitat, which for many of the, you in the know, uh, will will recognize is a place where there's a lots of rare plants and lots of diversity, lots of native species. Uh, more than 400 plant taxa or species, subspecies, and varieties have been documented on, on Walker Ridge. Uh, as interesting ecological, eco-regional context, um, lots of topography and elevation to give a lot of habitat heterogeneity. So you have a really special place for 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 regular old diversity. This is also an epicenter of rarity. Where there are 30, 30, it's now 35, I think now, rare plants ranked by CMPS have been found there. Many, many, many rare plants for a, for a relatively small area. 8,000 acres with 30 or 35 rare plants is a lot of, of rare species. There are places in the state that have a lot of rare plants on small areas, like Torrey Pine State Park is another one of them. Some of our coastal parks in, in, in Southern California, especially, have lots of diversity as well. But this is a lot of rare plants in a small area. And this is an area that has been threatened by commercial scale wind energy. energy. Um, of course, we are very supportive of the development of renewable energy in the right place, but this is put, putting a industrial development on a, on a biological and rare plant hotspot is just generally not the right thing to do. Um, it's also an area that doesn't have a, a whole lot of wind, so it has pretty low energy um, generation capacity compared to other wind energy development sites or areas that have been developed in the past. Um, and so in the past, all the proposals have faltered. And in 2019, there was another one, uh, by the, this time by a Canadian company called Algonquin Power, um, incorporated as Calusa Wind, uh, to install 42, 400 foot tall wind turbines on essentially on rare plant habitat. And so this kind of, um, uh, just to step back one second, uh, CMPS has been advocating for the conservation of Walker Ridge for years, for decades, in fact. Um, I'm not the first person to fight for the conservation of Walker Ridge. Um, uh, and so it, CMPS even petitioned to have, um, sorry for the use of the acronym, and have Walker Ridge made an area of critical environmental concern in t twice, 2005 and 2011. These requests have been pretty much ignored by the LM, uh, as have numerous other calls to conserve the area. You see, this is a really special area. Like there's, this, it, you know, it's, a, it's chaparral mostly, a lot of chaparral habitat. Um, and when it burns, it turns into this amazing um, uh, display of wildflowers that are then, you know, you know subsumed by the, uh, the, you know, the growing chaparral um, shrub species. 
but it's just a spectacular place to to see plants and and to appreciate um, the diversity, especially in the north coast ranges of of California. Um, so that that proposal, um, to new proposal to develop wind on Walker Ridge, um, caused us to reform um, alliances to to fight uh, against that proposal. Uh, CMPS took um, a, played a pretty big role in that, along with uh, many of our, our our classic partners like Sierra Club and local groups like Tuliomi and Cal and, and state, other statewide groups like Cal Wild and Defenders of Wildlife. And lo and behold, through um, through conversations that that CMPS and partner organizations had, um, the 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 congressman, so the 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 gentleman who represents the third district, which includes Lake County. Uh, John Garamendi decided to introduce draft discuss discussion draft legislation to add the Lake County portion of Walker Ridge to Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument. Now, that's not it, not all of Walker Ridge. So there's a map. So there's the in in purple or sorry pink is the proposed Walker Ridge addition. It's about 4,000 acres, which would be added to the Berryessa Snow Mountain Monument, which is to the west. Um, it would. Um, this is, um, you know, a very kind of, I would say, a um, it's a strategic decision in that um, Walker that Walker Ridge occurs in two counties. Lake County is very um, the the folks in Lake County, the Board of Supervisors, uh, local residents are in very much in support of this, whereas um, Calusa County maybe not so much. So, but the the bottom line is, if this this legislation goes forward and is signed, it would actually get signed by the president. Um, it would make the future development impossible because of um, the road runs right along the, the county line and crosses it in many places. And so there's no way that you could, you know, widen the, the road and to get a, um, you know, to get a big turbine up the, on Walker Ridge. So this would be, uh, and it also require, would require that, ma that a management plan consistent with the, the National Monument, so various Snow Mountain National Monument be in place. And so this would basically result in the long-term conservation of Walker Ridge and no no renewable and no wind energy up there. So that's a really good thing. Uh, we have lots of support. Um, uh, the Lake County and Yolo County Board of Supervisors, elected officials, so the state elected officials from the areas, uh, you know, uh, support from from Lake County support it. Uh, we have a great uh, collaboration with one of the local Native American tribes, which is the Yocha Dehi Wintu Nation. Um, and we, they, the Wint the, the Yochadehi have decided that um, that Walker Ridge maybe needs um, at least needs a new informal name called Condor Ridge or in uh, Putwin, which is the their language, the Molak Layuk. I'm probably screwing it up. Hopefully nobody speaks uh, Putwin in the in the um, in the audience tonight. But so this is just really, I mean, to me this is really really exciting. Um, so the next steps here on Walker Ridge. Uh, if if, let, if um, we just ended the the comment period, the draft dis discussion draft comment period, we had really good support. We um, uh, we have all um, great great positivity that um, and optimism uh, that legislation will be introduced uh, informally into Congress, um, and we'll have to do additional support and advocacy for this. And if you know maybe a year or so down the line, if it all everything works out just fine. Walker Ridge will be saved. And so that's really, really, really exciting. So I'm gonna shift now, shift gears a little bit, getting back down to um, a little bit more of the granular level and talk a little bit about litigation. So CMPS, um, as many of you know, has been engaged in um, litigation to um, hopefully support the conservation or to support the conservation of special areas in the state for also for decades. Um, but I just wanted to give an update on some of the key um, pieces of litigation that were that are that are ongoing. Um, for for those of you who have been following us for following CMPS for a little bit of time, it would be um, probably hard to, to not to know that we've been advocating for the conservation of uh, this very special place on Tejon Ranch called Centennial, uh, one of the best grassland habitats left in in California, native grassland and wildflower habitats. Um, this is um, uh, we when we pursued um, the approval to do litigation on on the Centennial project on Tejon Ranch. Um, the South Coast chapter was one of the chapters who who um, uh, who re supported this with a letter. So I thank you thank you um, to the South Coast chapter for helping us along. Uh, this is led by the conservation program, and we are co-plaintiffs with the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, 
uh, major issues r r in this lawsuit involve uh, grassland, lots of grassland habitat, rare plant impacts and, and wildlife and, and, and wildfire risk and greenhouse gases. So the news that I am, I'm really happy to share, if you hadn't heard it yet, is that this late this spring, uh, we got a ruling from, uh, from the judge in the case. So that went all the way, it went from the petition stage uh, all the way through trial and everything in between. And um, we won, essentially. I guess that's the right way to say it. Um, uh, there, we raised the, the, the brief and our, um, the case ended up being combined, at least in, in, um, uh, for all intents and purposes, combined with a, another case that was brought against the project by, by Climate Resolve, which is a group that deals um, quite um, uh, you know, self-explanatorily uh, with climate-related issues and greenhouse gas-related issues. Uh, so the CMPS case was combined with Climate Resolve. And um, uh, co the combined brief uh, raised 24 issues, and the ruling in favor of us was in three on three issues. Uh, so those related to um, the use, the improper use of cap and trade, which I'm not going to go into that. Just know that it was a greenhouse gas related issue, and then an improper analysis of the increased risk of wild wildfire to adjacent areas. And I'm not going to read through this, but you know this is something if you want to want to while I'm speaking about it. The big, the most important part of this is that um, the end of the, this is straight from the, the ruling. Um, accordingly, the project's entitlements are set aside, which means that this project cannot go forward as designed at this point in time. So there's a couple of things that can happen on Centennial. So the Tan Ranch could appeal. Uh, they could uh, revise and recirculate their environmental document. Um, and then there's there's still a little bit of there's still things that we need to, to figure out here. There's some clarification on the ruling. There's some still some questions that are needed to be answered. Um, essentially, it's probably far from over. We said I said we won, but we really just won. won um, you know, this uh, it's like maybe this is the the second inning in the baseball game. You know, we're still you know a long ways from conserving that part of Tejon Ranch. Um, I'm going to shift. Um, you're just going to get, you're going to get a, a smattering of um, of uh, conservation issues from around the state here. Uh, there's uh, a like in 2000 and I suppose it was 2020, just about a year and a year and a few months ago, uh, CMPS entered into a lawsuit on a big resort development in in what's called Gwinnock Valley in Lake County. Um, this is um, the major issue on this project was uh, huge impacts to rare plants. There's 20 or so rare plants on this project site. Um, this is the type. This is a um, a resort and housing development on some of the some really fine fine habitat. Um, CBD, the Center for Biological Diversity, also um, uh, has sued on this project. Um, our case was consolidated with the Center of Biological Diversity's case. Um, and then our state's attorney general um, decided to intervene on this on the case uh, with related to re with regard to fire issues, um, and we have a trial date set just for a couple weeks from now. And we are super optimistic that we could um, have a big win on this project. I will certainly, if you stay stay tuned, see it. We will we will definitely post information on uh, the re results of the of the trial on this on our social media platforms. Uh, and on the CMPS website. Um, I'm not gonna say a whole lot about this, but there is a um, beautiful habitat uh, just to the uh, west of Patterson. So in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, the proposal to, um, to do a, a, a new dam where water would be pumped from the Delta for storage in this, um, this um, very, very special canyon called Del Puerto, Puerto Canyon. Um, CMPS joined a lawsuit with uh, several partners, including, well, Sierra Club, the Center for Biological Diversity, and Friends of the, of the River. Uh, this is a, a case that is ongoing and moving pretty slowly. Um, so stay tuned for news about that when things finally get um, unstuck with that case. Um, there's a case to the south of the South Coast chapter um, in, in um, San Diego County, led by the, by the, by the San Diego chapter. Uh, our our um, our wonderful volunteer Frank Landis. Uh, there are multiple plaintiffs on this one. This is not a project that I'm super um, I'm super um, tied into because of the the chapter's involvement. But I, I I am told that a ruling is imminent on this case. So stay tuned for that. 
And then um, if you've been around CNPS for, uh, for some time, um, actually, so um, uh, Steve Hartman, who is uh, in the LA Santa Monica Mountains chapter, who's, whom some of you probably know, um, when I first started working for the state office in 2018, I went and met with him. And he gave me a, a binder of information on WEMO or the West Mojave Plan um, from way back when he was working on it in the early 90s. Uh, CMBS has a long history with the attempt to um, manage um, vehicle-based recreation in the millions of acres that, that constitute the western portion of the, of the Mojave Desert. Um, it's a very complex issue. Uh, there, there have been past lawsuits on this, some of which CMPS was involved in, uh, particularly in the early 2000s. Um, the current version of the of this the West Mojave Plan is also deficient um, in its analysis of impacts to things like rare plants and the desert tortoise. And so, we recently decided to join a lawsuit with a number of organizations. You see the list there. Yeah, you see the CMPS has a has a um, a, I guess a typical list of partners, including Sierra Club and the Center for Biological Diversity, I suppose for good reason. Um, this is, uh, the petition was filed just, just last month. Uh, and so, you know, we'll continue to update folks, um, you know, as, as I've said before on social media and, and other platforms. There's a couple of other active cases led by chapters. Uh, there's one on Fort, Fort Ord and also one on Point Molot, Molotti. I'm noticing that I've already burned through about 25 minutes of my time here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna breeze, breeze through that. So I have time in the 45 minutes allotted to talk about some of the other areas that we're working on. So shifting from, from the litigation- yeah, that, you, could that, that have, you could probably have a little bit more time, like up to an hour. Okay. Up to rush two okay, minutes. cool. Okay, I won't rush too much then. I realize I'm trying to, I'm working in a lot here. And so um, I'm, I, I realize I'm going fast and I really want to also take time for questions. So if folks, if I've gone through something and, and, and something really piqued your interest and you wanted to learn more about it, let's definitely, we can, I'll stay on, you know, as long as, as folks have questions, okay? Um, or as long as, as David wants to stay on and have the meeting still going, okay? Yeah, no, that's um, great. So, we, we have lots of time for questions afterwards. So yeah. Go cool, ahead. that's great. And you're so far, the talk is fabulous. So keep going. Oh, thanks, David. Cool. So, okay, so shifting now to um, just some projects and project areas, drilling down to, well, some of these things are actually, some of these, er these project areas are quite broad and have all kinds of implications that, um, you know, just, Oh no, it's not, it's not advancing now. You know, you're not gonna get through a talk without some, um, some technical difficulties. Um, I will start with mining. Uh, believe it or not, we're still mining on public, private and public lands in California. Um, and in this case, on this slide, I'm highlighting two proposals to do gold mining, um, which I suppose gold has some uses, like I think in, in um, electronics, but certainly, we it, it seems it seems like a terrible um, Faustian bargain to want to mine uh, special places like conglomerate Mesa um, for gold for jewelry. I mean, it's fine to have gold jewelry, I suppose, but this is a, a sacrifice I I don't think I really want to make. Um, so the first I'm going to talk about is mining that is being proposed on BLM land in, in the Indio Mountains of Indio County, um, uh, the conglomerate Mesa. Uh, is overlooking, you know, places like, you know, if you're on conglomerate Mesa, looking out from the Indio Mountains, you'll be looking at our snow-capped peaks of the Sierra Nevada. Um, a very, very special place, lots of rarity, lots of rare plants. Um, this is a, a, a project that has one of the strongest environmental coalitions that I can think of, of any um, major project in the state, led, led especially by Friends of the Inyo. Uh, we have a great um, volunteer um, uh, named Maria Jesus, who did her, also did her graduate work at the, the garden formerly known as Rancho Santa Botanic Garden, California Botanic Garden. Um, she and I didn't really, I don't think we overlapped when we were in, in our times there, but uh, Maria Jesus is a volunteer with the, um, who did her graduate work on conglomerate Mesa doing a flora there. And um, she has really taken the lead for CMPS. Um, also Isabella Lingon, our conservation analyst has been doing a fair bit of work on it as well. Um, Fighting, fighting this project in all ways possible. Another proposed gold mine in Nevada County, 
called Idaho Maryland Mine, which would actually be reopening of a of a mine that was in operation in the past. Um, uh, also, uh, this is a, a project that we're collaborating with, uh, especially Isabella is <coughs> with our local Redbud chapter. These are things you should know about. Uh, there is this is um, you know some pretty big impacts associated with both of these projects, the ones that we'll be working on in the coming months. It wouldn't be a conservation talk, uh, uh, especially led by the state, I suppose, without talking a little bit about solar energy development. Um, this is probably, um, you, uh, some of you are probably tired about hearing the impacts of, uh, about the impacts of solar, uh, solar, large scale solar on intact lands in our California deserts, uh, just as I'm probably tired of, of fighting these projects and advocating that they be um, placed in better places. Like, I mean, really let's like be very, very, um, uh, clear, like we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be developing renewable energy on intact lands. We need these lands for um, uh, buffering for our, our, you know, our plants and animals from climate change, uh, and providing the ecosystem services and recreational opportunities that they provide. Um, you know, solar energy really should be on top of roofs. It should be on uh, on disturbed lands. It should be on. Um, you know, I mean, there's been studies that have shown that you could put a large amount of solar on top of our, our, our California aqueduct. And not only would you be producing energy, you would be preventing, preventing evaporation of water that's headed south. I mean, there are so many better options than putting um, solar in the desert on, on intact lands. That said, we'll still be, we're going to still be, we're, we are dealing with several projects that are being, being implemented on, on our public lands. One called, one, there's one called Oberon. Uh, both and uh, there's one, there's two projects called Arica and Victory Pass. These are all along kind of uh, in Riverside County along the I-10 corridor. These are both being implemented um, in the area that was covered by the Desert New Renewable Energy Conservation Plan or DRECP, as you see there. Um, Desert Solar slash the DRECP would be an entire talk that I could give, uh, but just wanted to inform you that, th that this is still ongoing. There's also, unfortunately, a disturbing amount of solar energy development in the Western Mojave, uh, specifically in Kern County, where there are essentially dozens of projects that, that have been proposed, that are, have been already been permitted and will be permitted in the future on private lands. Some of this, these developments are on areas that are pretty disturbed, some are not. And um, I would say, you know, CMPS and some other organizations, uh, some of our partners are continuing to track these projects and comment on them. Um, but it is, I will say that what's going on in the Western Mojave, especially in Kern County, is a, um, a bit of a slow moving disaster. I mean, there is one project that, um, that Isabella, um, my, you know, our conservation analyst submitted a comment letter on, um, which is called, um, um, it starts with a B. I mean, I'm blanking on the name right now, uh, and I'll come up with it if you need it. Need if you need me to say the name, but is um, is 8,000 acres, and they um, in their EIR they admitted that they just didn't do rare plant surveys because it was too dry. So imagine an 8,000 acre project on near California City, so kind of north of uh, north and east of Lancaster Palmdale, uh, on essentially it's intact lands that they didn't even bother to do rare plant surveys on, and so. This is, you know, um, in order to really fight these projects would be, we would need a lot more resources. We need a lot more, you know, essentially Kern County is a pretty pro-development county um, and, and is uh, organizations that have sued in Kern County have not been super successful. So this would be, to fight these projects one by one would be a, a Herculean effort. I'm not saying that we won't, um, we won't try or other organizations won't try, but I'm just wanting to let folks know that this is um, this is a pretty um, a potentially big, big issue. Um, cannabis is an issue, um, uh, shockingly one that we have to deal with. Um, of course, the legalization of of, of cannabis is um, not something that's that's inherently bad, but when um, when the, the when the development of areas to to grow cannabis conflicts with intact habitats, we have a problem. Uh, there is a lot of illegal cultivation. There is um, problematic legal cultivation that's being permitted without adequate environmental protections, uh, without environmental adequate environmental review. Um, it is a problem really without a clear solution. Um, 
and it is um, it is also a um, Herculean effort to track these. Um, Isabella has been taking the lead for CMPS and and working on um, on as much as this as she can. Uh, and we also have, I will inform folks on this chapter in case they're interested in participating in the uh, working group. We have a, uh, we have a cannabis issues working group that I believe is taking place on the first Wednesday of each month at nine o'clock in the morning. So if anybody is also interested in learning about what's going on with cannabis in California, as it relates to the conservation of habitats, uh, let me know, send me an email and I'll put you in touch with Isabella. Um, this is shockingly, um, I maybe said shockingly too many times in this talk, unfortunately, um, there is an awful lot of, of, of cannabis large scale, like acres upon acres of cannabis being grown in our deserts, which involves things like water theft and all kinds of crazy things that we've been hearing about. Um, you know, our Western Mojave in particular gets hit a lot of times by a lot of different things whether it's solar or cannabis or inappropriate vehicle-based recreation. So, you know, it's, we all love the desert. And I, it's one of the things I miss most about not being in Southern California is being able to go to the desert and escape, um, you know, escape, you know, being in the city or being in the suburbs. And um, it's kind of, it, it gets, it gets hit on, hit by a lot of different impacts, unfortunately. Uh, we have some forestry related issues that we're tracking. Well, this is not a Southern California thing, although I guess there's a little bit of forest that, forestry that could happen in our mountains in Southern California. Um, primarily in Northern California, these are issues that we're dealing with. Um, uh, the, if you're familiar with our, the review of, of, of harvest of timber on private, uh, private uh, um, lands in the state, it's done via the timber harvest plan process, which is a CEQA equivalent process. I'm not going to get into that. I don't even know why I put it in a talk that I'm working, I'm getting through this quickly. But um, the bottom line is that what is happening here is that there, the um, uh, CAL FIRE, who is the agency that approves timber harvest plans, is allowing uh, some of these plans to go forward uh, without even doing botanical surveys before approving them. Um, this is a legal issue. Uh, CMPS recently co signed a letter um, with. Um, the, with EPIC, which is a, a, a environmental group out of uh, uh, Mendocino and Humboldt counties, um, that is um, that has kind of, in a sense, put um, Cal Fire on notice that that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. Um, stay tuned that this could be something that that kind of escalates in the in the future. Um, Isabella has been um, also working with the board of Serv board of forestry, which is um, uh, a, a a part of Cal Fire to um, to ensure that there are better botanical survey guidelines um, for these timber harvest plans. Um, and we've had some success there. I think that the work that Isabella has done has been meaningful and has resulted in some, some good changes. Um, I'm not sure it's going to solve the problem um, with, with, um, with CAL FIRE approving plans before there is adequate documentation of the impacts of botanical resources, but uh, we will see. And then just there are some um, there there are other things happening on on federal lands. There are some, there's there's um, that we'll be working on some forest plan revisions on on the in on the Forest Service, specifically the Sierra and Sequoia National Forests. And as I'm getting kind of towards I think the end of of my uh, my presentation here, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about fire. Uh, fire is is um, you know, it's undeniably a, a huge issue in California. Um, if we end up uh, getting through um, uh, this current fire season without, you know, any huge wind-driven fire events or dry lightning outbreaks in Northern California, I would we would consider ourselves lucky. And I know that's that's a hard thing to say given how many millions of acres and and such devastation has taken place already in this um, this year. Um, but you know, it's. I mean, I, I mean, I've lived in Southern California. I know that we're just at the at the heel on the heels of Santa Ana season, so I'm a little still a little bit scared about fire and, and what the impacts could be on human communities um, in the in this coming months. But let's cross our fingers. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on fire, and it's not necessarily that fire is a bad thing. We know that it's it's a it's a natural part of um, and, and indeed an essential um, factor in many habitats, in, mo in, in actually most habitats statewide. 
but where um, essentially what ha what needs to where our advocacy needs to needs to our advocacy role needs to step in is often related to actions that are being being made, taken to um, either prepare for wildfire or to respond to what has happened after a fire has occurred. So at the state level, we do a lot of work with coalitions to, to formulate positions on um, fire-related issues. There are many bills that are introduced, kind of like circling back to the beginning of this talk, that, that are introduced in every year, every year to deal with, with one aspect of another or fi of fire. There are a lot of budget allocations that are taking that are that are being being um, being um, adopted by the state government and the federal government to to work on fuel management or uh, preparation of communities in anticipation of fire. This year alone, 1.5 billion dollars has been allocated out of our state tax dollars to go to go towards various actions, including lots of um, clearing of, of of habitat. Uh, and some good things that we would we, that we would actually be happy about, like um, introducing prescribed fire into forests in the Sierra Nevada. Um, we provided testimony and written letters, um, and at, and um, you know just done all kinds of things to advocate what we think what what we think is for what we think is the right approach to fire and fuel management in the state. It is a it is a huge huge amount of work. I can tell you that if we had you know two staff people to devote to this issue, we could use them. And that would be them working on fire and fuels issues and nothing else. It's a huge amount of work that, need, that is needed and we are, we are you know, essentially doing our best. Chapters, are, some of our chapters also do a huge amount with local issues related to fuel management. I know that um, even uh, Chris, is, um, uh, Chris Sarabia from, from this chapter has, were, has been working on fuel management, fuel modification issues uh, in, in, the, in your local area. Essentially, you know, there are there are issues related to fire that are touching uh, essentially every part of the state. Um, there are there are um, you know so you know the the photo that I'm showing is what happens when mastication occurs uh, in a forest. Um, I'm not sure I like that. You know, you see a lot of um, of you know chipped vegetation on the ground level. Um, I'm not seeing in that in that case of that mastication project a whole lot of opportunity for uh, for uh, for um, you know herbaceous plants and shrubs to come back in any in 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 um, near time period. So this is what we're dealing with. We are dealing with uh, things that we would like to see, including maybe prescribed fire in, in habitats where they're appropriate. And then we're seeing some things like, like you know, the construction of fuel breaks in remote areas or um, mastication of chaparral in some cases. So like some things that we are really, really not happy with. So, that is to say, there are, there are, there. This is happening at the local level, and it's happening at the federal level on on some landscape scale projects. We're tracking a project in um, called the North Yuba um, uh, Fuel Management Project. I think is that's the that's the the formal name of it. Isabella is working on this, which is hundreds of thousands of acres of land management under a single environmental document, and that's a little bit scary because you know that is. Um, a lot of treated area, potentially treated area that could take place um, with the, a single environmental review without a lot of review uh, potential for uh, intervention later on. Um, so I guess this is to say there is a lot going on with regard to fire and fuel management. I think that might be my last slide. Um, and that, I guess, you know, it is, yeah, I guess I've taken almost a, a full hour here, or at least 50 minutes. Um, I think I will open it up for questions at this point in time, because I know that I've covered a lot of ground, probably too much ground, um, but um, I will, I'm sure there are questions from the audience. So um, I really, really wanted to thank this chapter for, I mean, for supporting me in my career at CMPS and, and giving me a, um, a chance to present my, you know, the, what I'm working on over the years. Uh, and, you know, the collaboration with this chapter is, has been a good one, and I, you know, would love to collaborate with you all more. And so I'm going to open it up from, from there. Thanks, Nick. Um, it was uh, really great to get an update. It's, it's really exciting, all the things that the uh, state is doing, the state CMPS. Um, we now have uh, for our chapter um, two uh, new co-conservation chairs. 
as well as uh, Megan uh, Wolf is also helping us out, um, not to mention Chris's work. So um, we're very excited to, to try to up our um, conservation efforts. Um, so, and of course, we appreciate all the support that you've given to our chapter uh, over the years, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, there is a- Yeah, thank you, David. You're welcome. There's a comment in the chat from uh, Andrea. Is there anywhere we could mm -hmm. write or call in support of Walker Ridge preservation if we missed the comment period? Um, yeah, so, so I think, so I think it would be okay. There's nothing wrong with, um, and I can, um, uh, Andrea, if you wanted to, to send me an email, excuse me, and I will send you the information on who to send a support letter to, and also some draft language that you could modify to in support. Um, the comment period has closed. But that doesn't mean that you can't send in a letter. I mean, it's not like a, you know, like a SQL comment period where it's closed and it's, and it's closed forever. Um, I'm sure the, the congressman would love to hear your support, essentially. And so in the future, though, so once, you know, so we're crossing our fingers, assuming that the Walker Ridge leg legislation gets introduced, which we think it will, there will be a lot of opportunities in the future to support the legislation, but in various ways going forward. So um don't think of it as, as that you've really missed that opportunity because there will be future opportunities as well but you can also send in a letter no problem at this point in time if that makes sense yeah. you might have covered it nick but um a more broad question related to andrea's question is is there a, a place on the cnps state website where people could go to get um, updates on uh, what's happening, conservation, uh, conservation issues, and people who just want to check in from time to time, mm -hmm. who may want to write comment letters? Yeah, so, okay, that's, that's a really good question. So our website has a lot of information, although I wouldn't actually say that the conservation program page is super, super up to date. It's pretty up to date, but it isn't like, up to date in the sense that it provides you with like information on on like what to do right now as far as action alerts are concerned or those type of things. For I would say that the best so we will post periodically on the on the CMPS blog and then also on social media for those types of things. So I would say the best place to get a lot of updates is if you happen to follow CMPS on social media. I know that not everybody does social media. I I have a love love-hate relationship with it myself um but um so i would that's where i would would mostly get information i would say uh if that makes sense what social media so speaking of social media um yeah it's a good time to put in a plug uh i i, I also have a love-hate uh almost uh, addiction relationship with it um but nevertheless uh our chapter does have a facebook and a uh, Instagram page, uh, and uh, State also um, has, I believe, uh, I know they have a, a um, Instagram, I'm sure they have a Facebook page as well. So Yeah, so usually when I, so usually when we have, um, so the other thing is, is that the, let me, I'll say, as I'm thinking about, there's other ways to find out information. So there is the e-newsletter, which goes out, I think, once a month which we often have uh, calls to action, conservation blurbs uh, in that. So that's an, in the email newsletter. And then in Flora, our quarterly uh, publication, we will provide updates. That's not exactly um, timely enough usually to, for somebody to take action. So if you are not into doing social media and we usually, when we have posts, um, especially calls to action, uh, we will make sure that it gets, I'll try to make sure that it gets out on all of the platforms that CMPS uses. That means Facebook, Twitter, and, and Instagram. And so, but then if it's short of following us on social media, which I know some people don't like to do for good reasons, uh, you can subscribe to our e-newsletter, which will give you some information on a monthly basis. And then periodically even we'll do action alerts to people who have opted in to receive information from the conservation program. 
And so like recently we did one for um, something I didn't even mention, which is um, uh, support of, uh, of state legislation to um, conserve Tesla Park, which is in the East Bay chapter, which is an area that was up for um, potential OHV or um, vehicle-based recreation development. And so, uh, so there, there are various ways to find out. And lastly, the conservation program webpage um, before our, con our, our communications director, Lee O'Keefe, um, departed from CNPS. It was on our list of things to update. And so I suspect like as we staff up in our, con in our communications program that we will, it'll be something that we'll work on and, and update in the near future. But um, so there's all, those are the ways that I can think of to, to stay informed. Great, thank you. So I think we could uh, open it up to the uh, audience now if anyone has a question. Oh. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Nobody? No question, unquestionable. So uh, I have a question then. Um, you mentioned mm -hmm. some legal actions, um, uh, is CNPS uh, paying for that or how, how does that get paid for? Because I know legal actions cost yeah. money. It, it varies, it varies. There are, there are lawsuits that the state has done over the years and at present where we are, um, we are essentially joining on to another organization's lawsuit. So for instance, Centennial, um, we didn't, that's not one that we contributed money to, um, the Wemo lawsuit, which we just, which was just, um, filed is one that is being done pro bono by the Stanford law clinic. Um, and so there are various ways. So, so the state, so the state office and chapters have funded lawsuits over the years that are, that can be quite, um, potentially costly. The cool thing about it is if, if we choose wisely and we don't lose, then if we win on a lawsuit and that's like, you know, you know, if that's even a, a one of the, one of the, went on one of the claims brought in a lawsuit, then we can recoup our legal fees. So there's that, there's that aspect of it. So the answer is uh, yes and no. So we do pay for lawsuits. We sometimes we don't. And then the good news is, is that if we win, if the if our lawyers are successful and, and we're successful, then it's a zero cost game. On the other hand, if we lose, then we and we've put in a bunch of money, then potentially it's 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 a loss to the organization. So I hope I answered your question, David. Yeah. Good. Any other questions from the audience? Let's see one hand raised. Yes, that's me, Ann Dahlke. Um, I, you know, I, I'm curious about the wildfires. Um, throughout your talk, you talked a lot about federal issues or federal agencies and their movements, but I didn't see so much in the way of states. And on the wildfires, the state is certainly getting impacted. And I got to wondering, um, back in the mid 70s, I saw fire management in Yosemite National Park, and I read recently that fire management within the um, Grant General Grant Tree of Sequoia National Park in that that local area that helped save the trees. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. is that type of management that's conducted by the national parks solely conducted with it, or is there other um, areas of California within state managed? Um, places that such intensive type of management is done and could it work? Does it really actually work in helping mm -hmm. um, deal with it's, wildfires? It's, that's a really good question. So, so there, are there are many places in the state where active management of habitat in an ecologically sensitive way is taking place. And that includes, so federal lands, the, like our national parks, it involves, it includes national forests, it includes private lands, it includes lands that are managed by our tribes. So there's a, there's a huge, um, 
uh, I would say resurgence in what we what we consider cultural burning, which is indigenous land management practices that um, you know Native Native Americans, uh, Native Californians, uh, have been managing and have the knowledge to manage land for you know for thousands of years, and that is slowly but surely being restored and and supported by um, by you know by CMPS and the state and other organizations and that kind of thing, and so that's that is taking place. There is, so there are various things that need to happen. So there is uh, often it's, it's, it can be very complicated. So each habitat itself has its certain, has its own requirements. Mm -hmm. So what is appropriate in say like the, the giant sequoia forest with regard to prescribed fire is not necessarily and almost wholly not, not is wholly not appropriate in say you know the chaparral of the Santa Monica mm -hmm. Mountains. That so, so there's there there is the fact that you know like different habitats need different treatments and respond in in a, in certain ways. Sometimes those um, prescribed fire can't occur just right out the bat. Sometimes they need to do a little bit of thinning ahead of time. So that's complicated. Um, there, so it's just uh, and. The unfortunate thing is there is there there is also uh, a history of land management that has taken place, especially in the Sierra Nevada, our, in our forests along the north coast, whereby um, certain practices, logging, um, fire suppression efforts have have made it that that it just isn't simple to reintroduce fire on the landscape, uh, and so the there is. I, I suspect in our in the coming years there is going to be a tremendous amount of of in reintroduction of prescribed fire and what I would consider good habitat management on a scale that is that hasn't taken place in a long time um, and at the same time there is also some habitat management actions that I am quite concerned about that I'm scared will take place and will be detrimental to habitats so. The issue of, of how our state is responding and how the federal government is responding to wildfire is super, super complicated. It's multifaceted and um, it is essentially worthy of probably a talk or two on its own. Um, and so, I mean, I, 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 I hope that um, my answer to your question, and has been, is at least somewhat scratching that itch, you know, um, because it is it is so so complicated, and it's pretty much as I expected. Is, yeah. Thanks. While we're waiting for the next question uh, in the chat, um, apparently October sixteenth, there's going to be a Los Serenos uh, nature walk uh, at Alta Vicente, meeting the city hall parking lot. Um, and then also there's a tour on October 10th uh, and uh, South Bay Waterwise Garden. And the uh, person that organizes that tour said there's a number of uh, native gardens or plants that feature, uh, gardens that feature native plants on that tour. So if anyone wants to look in the chat, the information is there for, for that. So thank you. Any other questions? Nope. I have a question. This is Chris. Uh, Nick, hey, Chris. Uh, hey. As, uh, since you were the uh, SoCal conservation analyst for a couple of years, do you mm -hmm. think that's something we should fundraise for as, a, as an important position? Or do you feel that um, you guys uh, are able to kind of keep track of things uh, with, you know, you have, you have a variety of staff and so I, I just mm -hmm. wonder, you were in that position and you covered basically just SoCal, or for the most part, I guess. Um, yeah, curious what right. your thoughts are on that. Um, to, I mean, to answer very simply, we definitely could use more capacity. I mean, that's there, I mean and, to, and that's something that we've discussed and I think is even, you know, it has, has some support at the state level you know, as in the, you know, like our um, interim ED 
is very much in support of, of us rehiring that position. Um, and so I, I, I think it's a very good idea, uh, whether, you know, I think, and, and if chapters were able to, you know, like including, um, you know, the South coast was able to, um, to help fundraise for that position, I think that could push it over the, you know, over the finish line. Um, and it, I don't think like, I don't even, you know, like it would be wonderful if the, if the South the Southern California chapters could come together and fund a, an entire position. But I, think, I think even just a, a portion of that position would be amazing. You know, like I think that, um, you know, as long as the board approves it, that we, and we have the funding for it, I don't see why we couldn't have a Southern California analyst position in perpetuity. Um, there's a long history of it, of course, like, you know, Eileen Anderson, who's now with the Center for Biological Diversity was, you know, was one of the first employees of the conservation program stationed in Southern California. So there's a great precedent for it. California is such a big state. There's so much going on in the south, southern part of the state. I think we are tracking things relatively well, but are there things that are falling through the cracks? Probably. I mean, I, I can't imagine that they aren't. Um, just the very, you know, the, the huge number of solar projects on, on um, you know, private lands in the, in the Mojave, um, that could be a full-time job for someone. And so to answer your, I mean, I could have just said yes. I guess that would have been easiest thing to say. Like, yeah, we could definitely use another position or two or three or four. Um, I mean, it's, and that's not just saying like, we just need more staff, more staff, more staff, because we do like, you know, we have wonderful volunteer capacity too. Like, it's not like staff can do all the work. We have volunteers that can do like who, amp who on a statewide level amplify the work that, you know, Isabella and I do by many times. But at the same time, you know, the concerted effort of and, and time of staff could be, I think, would be super useful in, in Southern California. Yeah, I would just add to that that the uh, developers and the uh, uh, industry people have armies of lobbyists and stuff. And so having just one person is, is not that much. And also, I think just in terms of traveling uh, and things like mm -hmm. that, um, you know, if we had a, a dedicated SoCal person, uh, there'd be a lot less travel. Yeah. And as I recall, when you were right. when you were here locally, correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. over time you have the opportunity to get to know people, and part of, of part of conservation work is getting to know the key players um, and, and you know the the friendly. Um, legislators, the friendly mm -hmm. government, other government officials. Um, so it, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of need. So yeah, we'll have to yeah, and other chapters and see what we could do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, so, I mean, like, assuming that we go back to what is a, a, a different normal than today, you know, where, where everything is online, like say like a year or two from now and like I just cross my fingers that COVID is like a thing of the past it probably won't be but maybe it'll be like in a managed way where we can actually start going having meetings again um right now it seems fine that we could like you know like that us folks up in Sacramento could cover what's going on in Southern California but if you know if we start having tons of in-person meetings like that may not be the case so and, you know, it would be, it's, it would be really hard for, you know, Isabella and I, who were essentially, you know, trying to cover as much of, of Southern California as we can, it, it would be very hard for us to, to have to do a lot of travel. I mean, travel is super expensive and time consuming. So there's, there, I mean, I think if we want to really be thinking about the future where, where things return a little bit more to normal, having some, having a, a conservation staff person based at a, at a strategic location in Southern California is probably a good idea. So I know that there's a monthly uh, conservation calls, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and I know that um, if if anybody wants to get involved at, at, at our chapter level on conservation issues, uh, just get in touch with us, uh, or if anybody has a conservation issue. Um, 
particularly that pertains to our chapter, um, you know, bring it bring it to our attention so we can uh, help you to work on it. Uh, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dave. Like the, our monthly chapter conservation chairs call is not just open to conservation chairs, it's pretty much open to anybody who, who cares to learn more about what's going on, on around the state. We hold those, those calls from 10 a.m. to noon uh, on the first Tuesday of the month, which happens to be tomorrow morning. So if you're free tomorrow morning, um, shoot me an email and I'll send you the information. And then I was just thinking like, so what's going on with your oil spill down there? Like, you know, like um, I could imagine that that might not be very good for coastal, you know, like coastal habitats. I mean, it's maybe a little bit south of the South Coast chapter, right? It's more like the Orange County chapter. Yeah, correct. That's Orange County chapter, but uh, uh, who knows? Some of that oil could still wash up here. But yeah, undoubtedly, if they're there on the beach cleaning up stuff and in the wetlands cleaning up stuff, um, that involves a substantial footprint on the ground and uh yeah i'm sure they're yeah i'm quite um i mean i i mean some of you may know i lived in orange county for about a year and became very very fond of crystal cove state park so the fact that it's being um you know impacted i think for sure by this is pretty sad yeah it, it is very sad the only possible good thing is that uh there are a number of pipeline uh, projects around the country uh, that are, how should we say, disputed, in dispute, and perhaps maybe this will give ammunition to people who are opposed to those pipeline projects um, to say, look, here's one in Southern California, look what it did. That's the only yeah. thing I see to this black, ugly, oily mess. Yeah. Today, the LA Times had, um, they had a number of articles uh, regarding that particular spill, and they, they listed mm -hmm. the ones that had occurred over the past 30 or so years. But one thing they noted that whenever you have oil operations, it doesn't matter whether it's on land or in water, you have spills. And the only way mm -hmm. to really deal with this issue is to quit using the product. Yeah. So yeah, sorry, that's a real bummer, isn't it? Jesus, sorry, I should have like, do you have, so does somebody have a happy story that we can end on here? So that's really not the way conservation talks go usually, I suppose. I, I don't have a question or anything. I just wanted to comment. Uh -huh. I heard you talking about how much you loved living in Southern California because you could visit the desert. I was actually yeah. in Death Valley this weekend and it was my first time and man, you're, you're you're so right like now that i've been yeah. there once i think i'm gonna go back multiple times because it's just really amazing yeah, yeah that's that's the that's the fun part i mean california is an amazing place like there's no doubt i mean and and you can like you know like and i'm in sacramento i can go to the coast and i can be in point reyes i could go up to the sierra nevada in a given day but southern california has like I mean, has the desert right there along with the mountains and everything. It's pretty rad. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's, it is one of the best selling points for Southern California, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it's all good, but um, I miss it a little bit, you know, I have to come. I mean, it doesn't mean I'm like, it's not, it's not like, like the desert is dead or anything. I can come down whenever I want, but it's like, you know, I just can't just like jump in the car and be there in an hour or two. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. uh, let's see. Uh, all right. So, there's a comment in the uh, chat. Uh, are there volunteer efforts our members are participating in that needs help from uh, us, uh, specifically related to the Orange County uh, oil spill? Uh, our oh, chapter, yeah. I don't know. Our chapter is not uh, specifically. Uh, uh, involved in that, but uh, imagine if you contacted uh, Orange County chapter, they might know um, and stuff. Rosalie Preston put a comment in the chat. Um, there is a Land Expo October 13th and 14th in Long Beach at the Long Beach Convention Center. 
if anybody's interested in uh, helping us uh, to have a table there, um, let me know. Um, it'll be Wednesday and Thursday of uh, October 13th and 14th. So next week. So Adele also asked any volunteer efforts that relate to conservation or topics discussed tonight. Um, I guess that's directed to oh, you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so related to things to, that I talked to tonight, um, I think usually the best thing for, and I, I, this changes over time, but I think the best thing for folks who are interested in getting involved in conservation issues is to be involved at the local chapter because it's like, that's, I think, the, the best, the best, the kind of the best order of operations. That isn't to say that there aren't, you know, statewide issue efforts that that need help of individuals, but usually that gets filtered down from the state down to the chapters and saying like, hey, we need your help on something. And then that's the best, uh, then, you know, so folks who are queued up at a, at the individual chapter level are able to help then. And then aside from that, we do periodically do action alerts where we'll say like, hey, we really need a comment letter for X, Y, and Z projects. And so, and we'll probably do more of that in the future, you know, and, and so I, I hope that's, you know, satisfactory. So I would say like for the, the person who wants to be involved in conservation and CMPS, I would say like, um, you know, get in touch with uh, the folks, the conservation chairs at this chapter and um, ask how you can help. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, local is, is the most important thing because people are most familiar with that and typically most passionate about that. Uh, and there is no shortage of things in our chapter, uh, conservation efforts that, that need to be done. I mean, from, you know, just keep an eye on the golf course. Uh, there's mm -hmm. on at Malaga Cove. Um, there are a number of conservation issues uh, locally at home. So um, specifically, uh, if, if somebody wants to get in touch with uh, Kathy, uh, who is our conservation uh, chair, you could send me an email. Um, my email should be on the web page. It's uh, cnps.president at yahoo.com and um, I will make sure that your volunteering uh, efforts get to the right place. Your volunteer request. All right, well, thanks a lot, Nick, for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you are working on this stuff all day, every day. And, uh, so to, to come out in the evening as well and, and uh, spend your time on it, we really, really appreciate it. Um, no, this is this is like in all, in all honesty, being able to you know present a little bit about what's going on is in and to chat with the chapters is is super rewarding, you know. And like I said before, the work that is done at the chapters, and this is not just in the conservation realm, it really like like our staff is dwarfed by the amount of work that is done at the individual chapter levels. You know, when you amplify, for instance, what's done in your chapter, by, you know, 34 other times there, we can't even compare as a staff. So like, so, you know, keep up the good work done there. I really appreciate everything you're doing. And then the same, at the same time, when you have, I mean, like, I know that you, you, this chapter wouldn't hesitate to reach out, but if there's anything ever pops up, that you could use help with let us know that we're here to help you guys as well and and you know even if it just is you want to chat about something and say like we're having this issue what do we think we may not have the right answer or we may not have even a better answer than you could come up with but you know sometimes it helps to just have a different you know set of ears to chat with yeah i forgot to mention too um that uh, part of my inspiration for uh, inviting Nick was that in uh, at the September chapter council meeting, uh, we typically have a day set aside to a conservation update. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so that was last month. So you have to wait till next September to get that. But also in uh, 2022, uh, CNPS will be having its um, 
uh, triennial uh, conservation conference. And uh, I've been to the last three of them, and though, even though I have to say uh, I'm, I'm interested in conservation, but it, it's not my number one passion in life. But when I go to the, con I've been to all the last three in a row, uh, conservation conferences, and it's so inspiring to me uh, to see a thousand people in, in, in one room uh, that are all passionate about conservation and botany and, and the importance of plants. Um, and just to see that, to feel that energy to be there, uh, it's incredibly inspiring. So um, remind everybody, when is that conference uh, gonna take place this year? I mean, in 2020. So next, yeah, so next year, it'll be about a year from, from the date almost it's i think it's um in the mid-october range of dates chris okay. do you know the date the actual date uh let me double check i, I want to say it's in the 20s mm, okay so uh the conservation conference itself is like two or three days and then there's usually uh field trips for a couple of days before and uh it's going to be in san jose this year so it's a great mm -hmm. opportunity to up to the base. 18th, October 18th. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to say about the, the 2022 conference, I, I think like there's nothing, the decisions about like the program have not been made quite yet, but the conversations that I've been involved in, I think this is going to be a, this next conference will be, have something for everyone. You know, and it always, they always do, but I think that the, the topics that will be featured would maybe maybe I think they will be even more broad than in past conferences. That's my, that's my prediction at least. And so right. um, if conservation isn't your thing, if maybe you're a little bit more into horticulture or into something, you know, other aspects of the native plant world, um, really when, when we start putting out the information about what the conference will be, you know, have your, have your ears, uh, ears uh, wide open and your eyes wide open for that information. Cause you may not have wanted to attend before, but you might want to attend this one. Well, yeah, that's what I was kind of getting at. I think that, that uh, yeah, even if conservation is not your number one uh, priority and, or interest, um, it's, the conservation conference is way more than, than uh, just hearing about what lawsuits are going on or, or, or things like <laughs> that. Um, which, which is super important. I, 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 I don't mean to belittle that. I mean, it's, it's a critical no, of course not. organization does. But um, I mean, in past years, we had the uh, silent auction, we had the poetry slam, we had the music night, um, we had the art contest, um, just hanging out and, and, and um, what's the word? Uh, and, and I want to, I want to share a success story there that the last conference, uh, a lot of the water agencies were, were invited as well as the botanic gardens. And I think a lot of their native plant efforts came from those meetings where um, they were especially invited to come out and learn about how they can, uh, how they can really make a change in their communities and uh, in water conservation. Um, so you could kind of make those interesting connections uh, at, at this conference, you know, with agencies, uh, with uh, botanic gardens, with uh, landscapers, with your super scientists like Nick Jensen, you know, out there. And it's, it's just, it's a, it's a cool place to just meet all your heroes or just meet new people that are doing similar work or interested in the same things yeah. you are. It's, it's an incredible opportunity. The word I was looking for is to network. Um, and again, mm -hmm or what level you are at, whether uh, you're a student or you're a, a, a professor uh, or, or whatever, there's something for everybody. And, and uh, we always get fabulous, really top, uh, you know, world-renowned speakers that come. Um, uh, in previous years, our chapter has um, also funded students to go. Uh, and so, um, we, we welcome, I think most of the people in our chapter are older um, still, but uh, we, we're super excited to have young people. So um, for anybody who's uh, still listening, uh, if you know a young person, 
uh, whether it's a high school student or preferably like a college student, um, you know, who has any interest in botany, um, we're, we're looking for students to uh, uh, support to go to the conservation conference. Um, and um, we also have CONSI money available from our CONSI grant program for some uh, projects. Uh, and ideally, it would be great to have a young person's uh, section of our, our chapter. So um, if anybody knows young people that, that are interested in, in native plants and conservation, um, you know, try to steer them our way. Uh, because we, we gave a pretty nice uh, stipend to people as well as paying for their conference. And um, so it's, it's a really uh, great opportunity. People like Megan Wolf was uh, one of our student uh, attendees and now uh, works for the Land Conservancy and uh, works for us. Um, so she was able to network and really get a lot out of it um, being a student. Um, you know, a student who we sponsored to go to the conference. So I just wanted to bring up that as well. Just give people yeah, it's wonderful. Start yeah. planning for uh, middle of October. Put on your calendars now. All right, I think that's it. So thank you, everybody. Any last? Thank, uh, thank you so much. And like I said, if um, you see my email address, if you have any questions or comments or anything, just send me an email and we can chat. So thank you, everyone. Okay, take care. Oh, yeah, Rosalie says, uh, everybody get your native plant photos ready for our December 